Good morning, everyone. I'm Susanna. Um, if hopefully you guys are starting day two of the Games to Change Festival, hope you had a, a terrific day yesterday. Um, I know it was a, a, an exciting day, a long day, a lot of unexpected things happening throughout the day, but everyone stuck with us and, and I hope everyone had a great time. Uh, today, uh, we're starting off, I'm very excited about this, starting off with a breakfast session um, for those of us who are drinking our coffee. Uh, for some of you, it is about to go to sleep. Uh, Dale, I think it's probably uh, much later where you are. Um, but uh, to talk about how Games for Change is moving um, and I mean growing in different countries around the world. Um, and I'm very excited to have with me um, our chapter presidents and leads in each of the uh, chapters that we have uh, in different countries um, and regions, actually, because it's not just about a country, it's about representing growth in a whole, um, in either a whole continent in some cases. Uh, so uh, the way this session is going to go, um, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes. I'm um, going to let each of our chapter presidents talk about the state of development of, of the community uh, where they are from. And then we will open it up to questions. And there'll be two ways for you to uh, engage with the conversation. One, you can do uh, a chat, a text chat on the right hand side. Uh, the other way to do it is to ask to have a video question. And uh, if you would like to do that, you can uh, register your interest and we will call on you um, once we move into that part of the conversation. All right, um, so I think now we can uh, kick it off. Um, so again, I'm Susanna and we have with me joined today um, Jean-Michel Blatier and Katerina Tillmans, um, both from the Games to Change Europe uh, group. Uh, and we also have Jilton Schwartz from Games to Change Latin America. And the newest addition to the family, Dan Linegar from um, Australia, uh, from Melbourne, I believe, yes representing Asia Pacific. Okay, so um, at first I just wanna say that uh, the, the concept of having chapters um, around, the, around the world isn't a new one. It's something that I know some of the uh, past presidents have, have worked on for years. I'd say about 10 years now we've been trying to grow different regions. Um, not all of them have been successful. Um, we've, we've definitely learned along the way what kind of infrastructure and support is needed in order to grow a community. You know, I think that's the most important thing to us is that we are, we're looking to develop, you know, a community of practice in an area that uh, will support and sustain itself to uh, hopefully have uh, some longevity. And it's not just about producing an event once a year, right? I mean, that's something that, that can be picked up and done and there are different business models and how to how to fund that um, and make that happen, even if it's done as a not-for-profit. But the idea is that we're, really, we're growing community, we're helping bring in new generations, we're helping expand the community with different partners and stakeholders. And as I said, there, you know, it's it's been successful, I think, in, in some, and in, in certainly in Europe and, and Latin America, but we've tried it in, in Korea for a year. We, we tried it in Australia about 10 years ago I know in Israel there was a chapter for a few years, and as I said, you know, it just wasn't sustainable. But so we're going to talk today a little bit about what makes it sustainable, what the challenges have been, um, where the opportunities are heading, um, and how, most importantly, how you guys can get involved, the people who are participating. So let's start with Jilson. Um, so in Latin America, um, you, you, this, this chapter has been around for as long as I've been here, so at least seven years or so. And I know that you've had your ups and downs in developing it, um, and you had to go quiet for a few years, right? It's just it's just the nature of what was happening in in Brazil. Can you talk a little bit about how it's structured? How do you run it? Uh, you're at a university. How what a role they take, and and what your you know what your learnings have been to this to this point. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, fellows, and all of you who are with us this morning here in Australia already in the evening. Well, we've been around for 10 years. Our first meeting was in 2010. I remember Alan Greshenfeld came to, well, online. But we are pioneers in doing an online conference. Our inaugural uh, event was at the Faculty of Communications in San Bernardo do Campo. And that was the launch of the project 10 years ago. We've been doing annual festivals as well. Games for Change Latin America. As you said, ups and downs. 
we very much are in sync with the economic and political cycles of the region. And sometimes this can be really tough, especially after the impeachment process. Uh, we had a really a deep recession, the pre-COVID uh, recession, and it was everyone was just you know paralyzed, and it was impossible to raise funds or even organize things. That the country was in shambles, really. So we we are now preparing for our eighth annual Games for Change Festival, and uh, the the whole project has been uh, supported over the years by many many st stakeholders. I think that's the main issue here: is the stakeholders as well as the, the background, the supporting uh, infrastructure of the University of Sao Paulo. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Film, Radio and TV at the School of Communication and Arts, and also at the graduate program, it's an interdisciplinary graduate program on humanities and human rights, and uh, this at the Faculty of Philosophy. So this gives us a, a very strong and stable uh, background and, and support as well as some funding because uh, trainees, they are always funded by, by the university through different programs. So the university backing was really very, very important over the years, as well as the National Game Industry Association. So we, from the start, we looked for partnership with the industry. This is really, really very, very important because we don't want just to, you know, raise the, the flag and, and see what comes after it. We, we have to talk with society, we have to talk with the industry and stimulate the, this approach, the, the Games for Change approach. So we, Abra Games has been a wonderful partner over the years. So the university uh, industry partnership is very important. We also had uh, different times, uh, different sources, funding from public agencies, research foundations, and also some private companies, some corporations that also supported our work. And most importantly, of course, all these stakeholders are important, but most importantly, the educational and social initiatives, the NGOs, non-governmental uh, organizations, and people who are really in the field, uh, promoting change, engaging with social change, engaging with education, with informal education as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here just to give you this overview. We are now planning our eighth edition of the annual festival. This will take place online as well uh, next November from 10 to 15. And we are very hopeful that this edition of uh, Games for Change Festival in New York will also increase our visibility and bring more partners in Latin America. Over the years, we've been partnering with the fellows from Chile, Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Peru. But I, I still see the Latin American expansion ahead as we move on, especially after this wonderful event that we are going through on our fantastic second day. Thank you all. I'll be back later. I want to tell you about the projects that we are promoting right now. And I'll share my screen and there's wonderful, right. wonderful new projects coming around. Thank all right. You. Thank you, Gilson. Yeah, we'll come around to future planning a little bit later. All right, Jean-Michel and Katrina, you, you guys also, I years now or something close to that. Um, why don't you tell us about how it's evolved within Europe? Um, you both are calling in from different countries, if I recall, Germany and France, right? Exactly. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit about your history. So should I start? You start. Katy, start. <laughs> you start because you started the whole thing. Okay, so yes, uh, the, uh, we, we started around 10 years uh, ago, indeed, and um, we started organizing a, a very small meetup uh, in Paris, uh, which brought together probably 30 people, uh, and uh, Cathy was uh, one of the attendees of this, uh, of this meetup. And after the, 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 the presentation, it was very, very small. It was just half a day or maybe a whole day uh, with different speakers. And, um, and we, we start talking together. And, uh, and we thought that it would make sense to have uh, two co-presidents, uh, a man and a woman, to have a French guy and a German woman. So that would be two major countries in Europe uh, teaming up to create Games for Change Europe. 
Um, and we have been working very successfully together. It has been a real pleasure and a real solid friendship. Uh, along the way, different other people uh, start joining, Simon Bachelier, uh, Sophie de Quatrebarbe, Catherine Roland, Pauline Gomi, Stéphane Natkin, and so on, different universities. So we immediately uh, established some link with some um, organization in France. One of them was Cap Digital, which was a local organization in the Paris region, uh, which was uh, aiming to promote uh, digital industries in this in this uh, in this area, and they started to support us uh, to organize the, the, the first festivals. Um, we uh, had uh, immediately started a good relationship with the, one of the major university in France. So having support of universities is obviously important uh, because there are people there like Gilson who are understanding uh, the, the the importance of this maybe more than in the traditional studios uh, the, 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 the academy and they, 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 they think about it they think about they consider the game world as a medium uh, and they, they understand the importance of uh, di diversity of approach um, and in Germany we Cathy was working with the Colon game lab or what was about to become the Cologne Game Lab, which was part of the University of Applied Science. And maybe, Cathy, you want to say a few words about the Cologne Game Lab and how, how you saw Games for Change, your perspective from the German perspective of uh, the Cologne Game Lab. Yes, well, for, for me, the encounter personally with, uh, with um, the concept of Games for Change and then meeting Jean-Michel uh, came at a very interesting point where we were about to start a, a completely new institute about making games at the university and from the beginning on our main interest there was about activism and about educational ways of uh, of gaming and on the other hand the arts really making artistic effort so our perspective uh, was really really from the humanities on gaming and um, uh, so this blended wonderfully in with the general idea of games for change and uh, uh, for a few years we uh, the cologne game lab was official partner um, uh, with games for change working together on festivals and uh, uh, the most impact uh, of the entire idea of games for change is still living on in the curriculum and evolving in the institute's curriculum and we have several university partners and joint curricula and exchange programs that all follow the idea that uh, that uh, games there's not just a segmentation between games for entertainment purposes and games for learning but this all can blend in and i think this is uh, where jean michel and i met and uh, for the past few years uh, we've been working together uh, on on the festival but my side of things is more really integrating curricula with universities doing workshops with uh, with uh, young adults it's really about the making part of games and then of course we have the other side of things where it's about informing the general public or decision makers about the capacity of games and this is what the festival and smaller workshops that we've been doing um, for the past years have been focusing on you're muted susanna i'm going to move over to dale who does not have a tenure history to tell about his relationship with games for change but I think this is really interesting because I'd love to hear, and I'm sure the audience would like to hear, I mean, what you've been doing, because you do have an you have do have a background, you know, in the kind of surrounding areas of of games and impact, and what led you to think that this is the moment to start uh, efforts in Australia. Thanks, Susanna. Um, the last six months does feel like 10 years, <laughs> to be honest, since we started speaking. <laughs> um I've always been involved in the serious game scene here in Australia, as well as a few people that are in the chat here. Um, and we have a very strong community over here, but at most of the events that we're going to, we're either fitting into other people's agendas or we are preaching to the converted. So we're talking to people who are already doing things and there's usually as much expertise in the room as there is sort of behind the, um, the dais. Um, so 
what appealed to me about Games for Change is that it's an opportunity to open up what we do to a much wider audience, um, to get educators and students and people like that involved who may not be involved in um, sort of more serious and hardcore events. Um, we do have a really strong community here in Australia and in the Asia Pacific, though I think the Asia Pacific is sort of this locked, it's almost a black box that's been unexplored until now. And even at this conference, I've just had so many people commenting um, and I didn't realise oh, there was all these great things happening in Hong Kong and Vietnam and all these different places. So I'm looking forward to learning about that because you, we don't know what we don't know so far. Um, I guess most of this stems from, as it does for everybody, is just the belief that uh, technology and games should be used to improve the human condition and to help society. Uh, and that's what our team, and it's not just me, it's definitely not just me, there's a whole team of people who we're actually having our first meeting tomorrow morning, so that'll be quite interesting. So that's how fresh we are. Um, but everybody's on board and everybody knows what's happening. Um, and we're really looking forward to highlighting the great work that's being done in the region, not just in Australia, Melbourne and Australia, but throughout the whole Asia Pacific. And Asia Pacific is huge. It sort of starts in India and goes all the way across to New Zealand. So we've tried to sort of capture that in the virtual booths that we have in the marketplace. And we're hoping to start next year as part of Melbourne International Games Week. We have the support of our local state government uh, and the support of the venue down here. We have support of all the universities down here. Um, so I think we've got all the right people sort of uh, behind us. And now we just have to make sure that we do the best job that we can. Um, and I'd just like to sort of thank uh, Susanna and DJ because we've been talking to them since last year. It's been a chaotic time. There's been fires in Australia and literally it's biblical sort of stuff that has been going on. Um, but we appreciate the approach that they've taken in sort of trying to create a sustainable model that lets us grow in a sustainable way and create something that can sort of last long into the future because this is our lives, this is what we do and we want to be here announcing our eighth event, announcing our 20th event, you know. Um, so, yeah. Well, welcome. Welcome, Dale. I know um, from my, my understanding, um, through our conversations about your background as a conference organizer. I mean, in, in addition to your work as a as a designer in the interactive space, you've been very active in uh, the simulations, right, community, and have seen that, you know, been part of that. I was wondering if you can just talk a little bit about, about that and, you know, where you see Games for Change. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, I guess and the, uh, the story I tell a bit is the first time I walked into what's called now the Simulation Congress in Melbourne, I felt like this was my church. I was at home. <laughs> um, and I just loved it. It was like oh, all these people using technology in the ways that I've always dreamed about. And I never knew that there was this little, not little, but, you know, it's a thousand people or so, but I never knew that there was this group that are so hardcore um, doing this sort of work. Uh and that was probably about 10 years ago. Since then, I've learned a lot more. Um, my specialty is more in games. My specialty is more in, as I said, pushing society in the right direction. Simulation is used in a variety of ways. <laughs> Sometimes it's not necessarily pushing things in the right direction. Um, and, and as is gaming, to be honest. Um, so I've ended up more in the serious game space. Uh, I'm studying in that space at the moment. I've made dozens and dozens of serious games with universities and institutions here in Australia. Um, and I just believe that it's what we should be doing. I've got three young children of my own. Um, and I think it's the way of the future, especially, and what's happening at the moment is kind of accelerating that change as well. So I think it's the, it's the most exciting space to be in at the moment. And I'm really happy to be here and to be part of it all. Um, great. Um, okay, well, let's let's have a chat. I, I do want to make sure that we're leaving time for q and A. I'm really happy how many people are are joining us, and I have a feeling a lot of people are going to want to uh, ask questions. Can you guys see my video? Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry, Arana thought she couldn't see me. Okay, Arana can't, but I'm here. Okay, Arana. Um, Arana's behind the scenes. She's making this all happen. Okay, um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what's coming ahead and where we think the opportunity lies. Um, 
Gilson, I'll start with you. I know that in, in November, was it November, December, you held a festival. Um, it certainly had certain challenges. I know there's still stuff going on in, right, in um, Sao Paulo, which, which affected some of the program, but you, also, but you were able to start some new programs. I mean, I know there was a pitch competition. I know there's a tour that you had and anticipated. Can you talk about how you've been able to um, launch programs around the festival and where you want them to go? Uh, I'm you, you. Always forget to unmute. <laughs> okay, so there's so much to tell and to share. Uh, we had our seventh edition of the annual festival last year. It got uh, really bigger than usual. We engaged uh, lots of uh, areas within university and beyond. We organized what we call the first Sao Paulo Play Week so that we could go beyond the, the festival in itself. So we had the festival. We also had the sixth edition of the Ludic Studies, Ludic Studies uh, Forum that's part of the uh, Rebel, which is the Brazilian network of Ludic Studies. It's our major partner now in the academic uh, sphere. So we are following the lead uh, that comes from New York. So we have the festival, which is more action oriented, and we have a strictly educational and academic sphere that uh, basically is peer reviewed papers. And we want to also support the emergence of new areas, academic areas and research areas in universities. So Rebel is playing this role of being more specific and geared towards the academic community with peer reviewed uh, paper selection processes and all that. So the Sao Paulo Play Week becomes something larger. We have the Games for Change Festival. We have the Rebel uh, Forum. And for the first time, we are also partnering with Games for Change New York with this new initiative, which is the Games for Change Accelerator. So we had a wonderful process here. We had the presence of, uh, well, Games for Change Accelerator was part of our examination board. So uh, we had this uh, one day with uh, almost 30 projects and three were selected and they are presenting themselves in our marketplace here this year. We also had the support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that uh, supported the three studios to come to Europe. And we did, uh, well, we almost completed, it was just at the, you know, uh, exactly when the COVID thing was coming. So we, we could do our tour with these Brazilian game studios in England. Then they went to Paris. I, I, I stayed in London because I was afraid of the virus. And then in Germany, we had also planned uh, to go to Germany. We had to cancel because everything was just, you know, impossible to move around. But we did the uh, start and now they are with us. I'll share my screen. Let's see if this works okay. So that I very, very briefly show you some of these uh, parts here with, with us. Well, one of them is the AMA one, it's the Amazonic. It's, the, it's a, actually it's a sound studio, a very well known uh, Andromeda studio. And they are, uh, well, it's a winner. Uh, Antonio Teoli is the lead musician. He did a collect a library of Amazonic uh, sounds, native sounds, native instruments. And this is going to be a fantastic resource for, um, for games as well. Not only for games, but uh, for games and, and other. Uh, another major partner now is Children of the World. Can you see the, the, the slide? I hope you're seeing this. Yes. Uh, okay, so Children of the World this is a game that's in the process now of uh, becoming a, a project in the market. And it's an adaptation of the Oscar nominated film, The Boy and the Word. It's won most, uh, more than 40 awards uh, all over the world and has been nominated for the Oscar. We are partnering with them as well. Uh, game Jam Plus. This is uh, an outstanding project that came out of Pitch for Change. So please check uh, Games for Change, talk to Ian, he's around, Gilson, talk to him. Gilson, the uh, slide didn't change. We're still on a MI. Did it change now? No. no, I think you need to screen share maybe the whole screen, not just the, the slide, I'm not sure. Let me, ah, okay, let me work on that. Sorry for that. So, uh, 
Yes. Okay, let me see now. Can you see now? Hold on. Uh, children of yeah. the world. Okay, so I've already talked about children of the world and Game Jam Plus. Please check children of the world and Game Jam Plus at the marketplace. They are here with us. Teaser Gravitational, a wonderful, wonderful game. A uh, guy in a wheelchair that, that challenges gravitational laws. It's one of the winners of the Pitch for Change that we held uh, last November in Sao Paulo. And this is really, really wonderful. I love this project as well. It's the big winner of the Pitch for Change, Fofu. It's really a wonderful project. Please check these projects in the marketplace. So, uh, and I have to mention also uh, the Purposium. It's a non-digital game that we developed in partnership with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. It's a non-digital game, and we are now moving on to a digital version of it. And uh, last but not least, I want to mention what Webex. It's a crypto, crypto coin, and we are partnering this year so that games that are games for change will be monetized partnering with the companies all over Brazil that want to support Games for Change. This is a major breakthrough. So I, I'm very, very happy to be here with you and to share uh, these new projects. Um, please come to our booths. So there's a Games for Change Latin America booth and all these projects have booths as well. They are all around. Rebel will be with us later today in the evening to talk about uh, what's, what are the plans of the Brazilian uh, Ludic, stage, Ludic Studies uh, Network. And yeah, I just want to be as brief as possible. There's so much going on, but uh, the most important thing is we are moving closer to a real impact. And I think that's the key criteria here. Yeah. It's not just about discussing the idea, but about moving on and making real impact in the world. Great, thank you, Gilson. Um, Jean-Michel, I think we might have lost Katerina, but hopefully she'll come back. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you, because I know that you've um, taken, at least in the last year or so, a focus on education as, as part of, you know, as, as a, a, a direction for a programming. Can you share a little bit about what you're finding that's happening in, in Europe? Yes, um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for this. Uh, so basically, what we've been at the beginning, we we try to duplicate what you were doing in the U.S. to create a festival as well with the different communities coming together. And so we usually have a two days event with half a day dedicated to health, half a day dedicated to politics, half a day dedicated to education, half a day dedicated to climate change or other other topics like this. And we noticed it was not working extremely well um, for, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I would say that the main reason, I believe, is that Europe is still under construction and that it was difficult to aggregate different, uh, different communities from different countries and to bring them to France or to bring them to... Um, they were not ready to, to, to really probably pay for the cost or see the interest or the, 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 the different countries were too different uh, and it was difficult to share between different uh, different countries and different communities so we uh, we've been shifting to uh, to something else and and what happened is that the education uh, department or area uh, became uh, something very very obvious to us uh, we got a strong interest from the french ministry of education uh, and it was interesting to see that a very big powerful public organization was interested in uh, digitization and and uh, and by games for change so they started to to support us and we started to organize a one day then two days event only focusing on education and uh, and then Ubisoft uh, decided to to join as well and it was interesting to see two powerful organizations 
application, and the other one was uh, Ubisoft, uh, the, the leading uh, stu game studio, uh, teaming up, and in a way saying, okay, let's let's try to do something together. And at the beginning, it was the, the meeting were really, I wouldn't say hilarious, but super interesting to see <laughs> that uh, that these two two communities trying to communicate and trying to to understand the, the and finding a common language, and it went pretty well. Um, and uh, maybe I can share a, a short uh, video of, uh, of, uh, of this. So let me share this application window. So share this, and then I do this, and I go here. So I will not, uh, the, the, I, will, I will have to change the sound uh, system. So hold on a second, I just need to do this. It's a little bit tricky. Oh, uh output is macbook air speaker okay <laughs> and it should work now Je suis très content de vous accueillir. Le CNAM s'intéresse à l'usage de technologies et de médias des formes d'éducation depuis fort longtemps. Autant je ne joue pas, mais j'ai extrêmement confiance dans le fait que le jeu est l'arme pédagogique la plus importante qui soit à la disposition des professeurs. La pédagogie, c'est quelque chose d'extrêmement sérieux, euh, qui est très partagé. Il y a beaucoup de théories. En game design, on ne boxe pas dans la même catégorie, mais on arrive. La récompense long terme est plus compliquée chez un enfant de 7 ans. Lui dire que c'est pour son avenir et qu'il aura un bon métier, c'est plus compliqué que d'avoir la coupe en diamant. Oui je dois vous avouer, c'est la première fois que je donne une conférence en tantôt. Hello, my name is Chaim Gingold, and I'm going to talk to you today about design insights from working on Earth Primer. Something that I love about our lab is that we're leaders in pediatry and imaging. So you can see here, we do a lot of work with infants. We do work with infants that are just even a couple hours old. Everybody knows Syria is in, at war right now. It has been, war has been going on for more than five years. There are something like almost three million kids that are out of schools because since the beginning of war there is no schools so try to improve the well-being of the kids as much as we can with the game <laughs> La relation aujourd'hui avec l'événement Gangs for Change, c'est un soutien que le ministère apporte à cette journée d'études et aux captations. Confronter, informer, trouver les points de vue qui font que les uns et les autres doivent mieux connaître les impératifs, les contraintes, les intentions au service des apprentissages et au service de l'enseignement. journée, on a assisté à un foisonnement de, de projets, de réalisations, d'initiatives et on sent bien que de plus en plus de gens, tant des enseignants que des pédagogues, que des inspecteurs d'académie, des industriels euh, et bien évidemment des joueurs, des game designers se, se saisissent de, de cet objet et tendent au-delà de la création de So maybe um, uh, remember, uh, the video represents a lot of different languages because I think I might have un de jeu éducatif pour partager cet enthousiasme et comprendre combien euh, c'est un outil précieux pour les générations à venir. I love how the fact that your video ends with a glass of champagne, as one would in print. That was lovely. <laughs> um, so I have to. So Jean Michel has to restart his sound. But I mean, from the, from the video, and I already can see in the comments, um, 
uh, uh, that there's a language problem. And of course it is. I mean, Europe consists of a multitude of languages and this is part of the new concept that we are taking on is uh, uh, making, making little or small scale events that can be really intimate because we can integrate the country's mother tongue. And this has proven to be a barrier for some uh, for people to join the community because not everyone is super uh, fluent when speaking and thinking and expressing themselves in English. Uh, and uh, for the French community, of course, following a speaker's um, session is a different thing than afterwards discussing in English as well. Um, and uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to make localized really specifically designed events for communities rather than sticking to this idea to make one festival that works for all European countries. And uh, I think uh, this is a good route that we've been taking on, starting with the French community and doing the same with, with uh, Germany, because these are our two uh, uh, mother countries. But we have small satellites uh, 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 with uh, friends and, and collaborators in, in the UK, for example. So this, we have the opportunity to really work on things in the Netherlands and other, other sister countries uh, in the following years. Great. Uh, uh, John Michel, do you want to say one more thing before we, we move on? Are you good? No, no, please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so the language, absolutely, I see that being a, a, a challenge. Um, it's interesting, you know, I was just thinking about how, you know, all of you are representing regions and really, I mean, although we run the organization, I guess, globally, you know, we're focusing on uh, the United States, which, you know, although there are multi languages here, it's really about a single country, really, and, and inviting people in from all over the world. Um, so the challenge is about different cultures that are different stages of development and understanding what games for change can be. You know, you have to think about and be strategic about where you want to focus your efforts, right? Whether uh, it seems like Gilson, Gilson, you've been focusing, you know, primarily on Brazil, but there are other other countries that have been actively involved. Um, and Jean Michel and Katerina, Germany and France, are uh, seems to be the, the that had been most of the focus. But as you mentioned, the Netherlands. I mean, there's a huge opportunity there, right? Um, and certainly in the UK as well. Um, so let's talk about um, Asia Pacific for a second. Um, so Dale, you're in um, you're in Australia. There seems to be a healthy game design community there. There seems to be, as you said, a serious games community there already. Um, and and then there is this other part of the region, right, which is the the Asia Pacific, right, which you say you're learning about on a daily basis, where there's interest. Sounds like there's a lot of interest. Um, Want to tell a little bit about what we we talked about this model of of having like Australia being an anchor, but then moving around each year to have a focus. Yep. And when we talk about Ivan, Ivan as well, your partner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, I wish our accent sounded like the French accent because I can listen to the French language forever and I don't know what it means. It sounds great. Um, we're facing the same issue, but ours is probably possibly even a little bit, you know, um, more amplified being in Asia that we have, like I said, everywhere from India to China. Um, we have countries like Japan and South Korea that usually do just speak their own language. They're quite monocultural uh, countries, um, all the way down to Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore also speaks English. So one of the first countries that we have reached out to and partnered with is Singapore and Ivan Gu from Singapore, um, because he has, sort of has his, uh, has reach into some of the Asian countries. Um, what I guess the international perception of Australia is probably a little bit different than the reality. Where I live in Melbourne, like Melbourne is pretty much an Asian city. And I know that sounds strange, but I've got three kids and they're all mixed. Um, and all of their classmates are mixed. So Melbourne and Sydney are very much Asian cities. What people tend to see, you know, on television and everything is the outback and uh, a, a little bit of a different perception of what Australia is. Um, but yeah, as Susanna said, we're hoping, initially we were hoping, we were thinking, oh, maybe we could swap between Melbourne and Singapore every year. 
uh, for various reasons, and one of them is just the logistics of getting something set up as part of Melbourne International Games Week here. It's quite a bit of effort. We're looking to become part of a museum called ACME and that they'd host us every year. So they host film festivals and all these sorts of events that you kind of need to, if you can get a slot there, you need to hold your slot there. So there's issues around that. Uh, there's other issues around how open various countries in our region are to social change. Some of them not so much. Um, some of them conflicting, uh, which is going to be an interesting thing to battle with. I know a few of the games I've already had suggested to me, some countries might not view them, you know, quite so well. So that's going to be a fun sort of challenge to deal with, but I think we're up for it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to speaking to you all, um, particularly around those challenges of how you deal with different countries, competing agendas, competing ideologies, you know, beyond just language. It's like, it's pure, it's absolute cultural clashes at the moment. Um, and that's something that we're going to have to navigate because we want to try to really represent this region. And we want to try to represent it in a way that doesn't leave a certain group out. Um, and whether that's inevitable or not, um, that's something I'd love to discuss with you all. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, we have about 15 minutes left. And while um, each of you will have your own session for 30 minutes uh, later today, and I maybe, Arana, you can just post again the times for those sessions here. So all of you are welcome to continue the conversation um, at, in, in those settings. So there'll be similar format. Dale, Gilson, Jean-Michel, and Katarina will chat for a few minutes, and then they'll be opening up for a conversation. But let's let's uh, open up the conversation now to the group right now. If you have questions you want to put, type it in the chat. You can. Otherwise, I see um, at least one person has, has said they're interested in asking a question on camera, which is fantastic. Um, and I think, Arana, you need to do that, right? So let's go to the moderated panel. Is that is that what I'm looking at? And we're welcoming. Someone, or did that go away? I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how this is to be working. All right, somebody might have left. All right, maybe a little camera shy there. Um, so there was a question about uh, that came into me about do we have interest in expanding to regions of the world like uh, Middle East um, and Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, the answer is yes, um, absolutely. Um, I think it'd be interesting to explore those regions. I think we're going to have similar challenges that Dale and Ella, all of us are having, right? In your different, in, in your different um, uh, continents, really. But yes, I'd be very open to having those conversations. We have not been terribly um, engaged in sub-Saharan Africa, but in the Middle East, there, ha there certainly is a community of, of developers um, and I would say that uh, Francisco Cavallari, who was featured in the Games for Change Europe um, uh, video, uh, actively works it, with those communities through Video Games Without Borders. Um, mm -hmm. And there does seem to be an active interest to helping uh, issues happening within the Middle East and across Europe with refugee crisis. Um, I don't know, Jean-Michel or Katrina, if you know more about that, you want to share? Uh, but Francisco is present. He did participate in a, a, a session yesterday um, and he can be reached through the people button. Now, again, Video Games Without Borders is a different organization. It's not related, it's not related to Games for Change, but um, they're doing fantastic work. Um, uh, so another question or comment was, how can a teacher researching game-based learning and gameful education living in Vietnam support the Asian chapter? So Dale, do you have a, a generic response or how you're telling people right now who are interested in getting involved, what they can do or how they can note their interest? Yeah, sure. If, um, if anybody wants to chat to us through the, uh, the Games for Change virtual marketplace store, I'll paste the link to that now. Um, I think some of these people have already. Uh, am I clicking on, uh, I'm clicking the wrong keyboard, sorry. Um, oh no, that's the wrong link. Uh, I'll paste that link in there. And 
you know, in terms of Vietnam in that particular instance, uh, we're already doing some work in Vietnam through RMIT University. So there's already connections that we can make with people who are doing things on the ground and we'll just try to connect everybody up that we can to work together because we aim just to be a platform for everybody to do what they want to do really. Right, so that's an interesting point, Dale, is that, you know, at the end of, really at the heart of Games for Change is being a hub of activity of, as a connector and a convener. So whether or not we are leading the actual programs or we're a partner or a platform in which people can share what they're doing so others can connect, that absolutely should be um, uh, part of the communities that we're developing. Okay, question for the panelists. Game makers and all people have an implicit bias, oh, this is a tough one, implicit bias when making content what sort of measures do you take to ensure that games you create can be appreciated and loved from a multitude of cultures and backgrounds? Um, I heard yesterday that some people bring in consultants that present groups. Is there a main method or are there others? Uh, this is, I guess, less a question about chapter development and more just about how you, you know, at what your personal takes are on um, implicit bias in games across, you know, different countries. Gilson, go ahead. This has been a concern for us because in Latin America and Brazil, of course, we have huge issues uh, related to race, gender. So this is one very, very important issue. First of all, first time after a long time last year when we did our festival, we made sure we partnered with the Brazilian Game Industry Association who established standards for diversity. So we, we had to follow a series of criteria to make sure that the festival was really uh, respectful of diversity, gender, race, special needs, people with special needs, accessibility. All this was double checked, triple checked, so that we made sure we had a diverse audience and we were respectful of this diversity. So this is really important. I think this is something that has to be built along with the with the several stakeholders because it's a cultural issue as they'll uh, very very markedly uh, remarkable it's really a societal issue we have to face that along with our partners well in terms of game design uh, of course i think that the best way to go is for those who are personally or collectively affected by these issues to be part of the project right now in sao paulo for instance there's been a, a new has been announced a new um, call for game projects. And uh, one of the criteria for selection is that you do engage black people and other uh, disadvantaged or marginalized groups in your project. This will count points. This is really that scores better for your project. So it's also part of the way we organize our pitching projects, our pitching sessions is to explicitly make sure we respect diversity. And last but not least, there are broad cultural issues. Of course, tango in Argentina, samba in Brazil, we have different cultures. And I think that uh, at least uh, from our point of view, we miss games with contents that reflect our regional cultures. So this is something that has been uh, on, the, on the table to respect the, 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 the issues that are uh, now so important, especially because we face a moment where all these social inequalities stand out dramatically due to the coronavirus. We, we realize after what's uh, been going on in the US and other places, we realize we are still lagging behind in terms of making sure that the diversity is within the structure, the logic, the mechanics of our games. Thank you, Colton. Um, so uh, we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to see if we can address this question. I mean, it's an interesting one that, that perhaps we can, if we don't have the answer today, we can uh, think about how to address. So the question is about curriculum. So on the education side, you know, in the US, there are uh, school-based standards, uh, computer science standards, next generation science standards. Are you aware of a base to work from to get more information about European curriculum standards or Australian, Asia, or, or uh, in uh, Latin America that aligns with that? And I and imagine this is for developers who want to adapt and, and 
you know, distribute their educational games in different markets. Maybe, maybe I can uh, make a start on that uh, because uh, in Europe, uh, aside from the different languages, we obviously don't have a common curriculum when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, school education and also university education. Um, uh, 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 when I take Germany, for example, we don't even have a common curriculum on for the entire state, but we are segmented in different sub-states. So um, this is really a, 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 a challenge for developers who want to go into this area of really working with, um, uh, uh, yeah, with, with schools or with uh, the Ministry of Education. Um, uh, a good uh, a good example or a good entry point is often uh, collaborations with the traditional publishers from school books because uh, they traditionally had the domain of really bringing the curriculum together and uh, and uh, working on that on, on products and a lot of these publishers have either a strong connections to developers uh, already or they are keeping on establishing some um, or on the other hand, they are um, considering to open up entire departments for developing interactive and playful media for the school curriculum. So this would be an angle um, that we could make connections on that basis. Um, and it's not so about uh, giving out a textbook, but really more finding the right angle for each country to, uh, to look at how you can, um, yeah, look deeper into this field and maybe find ways to work with the government. And uh, of course, this is a long-term process because um, establishing something in schools is a, a really, really long way to go. It might be even harder than establishing something in the health sector that is game related. This was really, uh, again, a lesson learned from this collaboration between the Ministry of Education and Ubisoft. It was, again, fascinating to see how the two organizations had to learn from each other. And they, both of them were full of goodwill to learn from the others. And, for example, to respect the, the privacy of the students, you know, and, and to not sharing data. And uh, we, one of the challenges that we had to, to face, for example, is that we were not allowed by the French Ministry of Education to work with any official sponsors like Microsoft, like Epic, or Unity, Epic, and, and so on because that would have been, uh, all these companies would want into the into the educational system and they were really careful about the privacy of all these uh, all the data of the students and wanted to make sure that it wouldn't become uh, a, an open door for for big organizations so for us it means that we have to give up on potential sponsors who might be interested in in in, uh, in supporting us another way that we've been we've been something we've been doing to try to overcome these difficulties of uh, local uh, local countries and local rules and so on and so forth when, was when we started the Autodesk Challenge, uh, when we met with Steve Vasco at the time and uh, Autodesk. At the time, we were having a series of talks about uh, Games for Impact uh, during FMX, this conference in Stuttgart that I was uh, organizing. And uh, Steve was very much interested in, in this Games for Social Impact. And, uh, and we started uh, with Cathy, the Autodesk Challenge, uh, bringing students from from all of all kind of European schools uh, together, and that was a very good way to, in my opinion, to uh, go beyond these limitations of language, limitation of curriculum, and so on and so forth. And I know, Susanna, that of that you expanded the challenge worldwide, which was uh, which was uh, really great. Uh, and I think this is something. This is for me typically an initiative that we should pursue all together. Uh, this is really uh, something because the, the the difficulty we had and we had discussion about this with Susanna was the fact that at some point you know we started this challenge for Europe but at some point Autodesk which is a global worldwide organization 
they don't want, they want to talk to 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 the US because they first of all they are based in the US they're an American company and they, 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 the first market is there but if we could uh, work together uh, between Dell Gilson Susanna uh, Scatti myself and other other chapters to really expand the student challenge for example to to different to different places that would be probably a good way to spread out this uh, this world of and this uh, this games for impact uh, concept yes well thank you uh jean -Michel. i think that's how i would actually would like to end it because we do need to end it because i gotta go figure out how to open the festival in a half an hour um is that the games for change chapters are not hopefully uh they are not all about only about the festival um, I know to different degrees, you guys have been able to create other programming. We would love to support that, whether it's through global challenges, whether it's through youth-based programs that we have launched here, or satellite events throughout the year, like talk and play events or community building. A absolutely, it's a team effort. Um, and um, I look forward to uh, working with you all to figure out what, what's going to be happening over the next year. I want to encourage everybody again to either attend the 30 minute sessions with each of the chapter leads, or if you can't make that, go register interest at their booths. Um, I think Jean Michel, yours and Katarina's is starting in about a half an hour, right? Yes, okay. we're starting about an hour. Before we, we finish this, I really wanted to thank you, Susanna, uh, for organizing this panel and for giving uh, the different chapters a voice during the festival. Uh, I think it's extremely important. Uh, I think it gives us, uh, as uh, flag bearers, and as you said, there are moments of optimism and moments of difficulties, and uh, it's uh, to sometimes to really keep developing and keeping the face and being together and seeing that we are all of us together on the same uh, on the same ship is super important. So huge, huge thank you for uh, creating this uh, this opportunity in the in the framework of the festival this year. It's very, very much appreciated. Terrific. Thank you so much, Jilson. And there was a one question in there about, are we going to do more virtual events? I don't know. Maybe we'll see if we survive this one. It's been a, a beast, um, but I do appreciate the benefits that, and the opportunity gives the people all over the world to participate. And that is very meaningful. Um, so thank you all for joining now. I will see you in just a few minutes as we kick off the second day. Um, and please reach out to all and any of us. Actually, the third option is a direct chat through the people's button. You can just send a direct link to Dale, Gilson, Katrina, or Jean-Michel. All right, see you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.